Of the many Celtic gods, Canonus is certainly one of the more intriguing. He's almost unique in being part animal, for instance, and in this image from the Gunnistrup cauldron, we have what is perhaps the most impressive depiction of any Celtic deity. It's this Gaulish god I'll be talking about, not the modern Wiccan god to whom the name Canonus has been applied, but the Canonus of the ancient Gauls. My goal here is to figure out what kind of god the Gauls believed him to be. What we'll be doing is looking at many of the images we have of him to see what we can learn from them. Now at first this might seem like a slam dunk. You only have to look through the writings of Celticists to see what kind of god he was. Over and over we read that he was a god of animals and of the forest. But as I read those descriptions, I became more and more uneasy. It became clear that the scholars were just repeating what others had said and that none of them had done any original research. I'm not criticizing them for this. Life is short in the field of Celtic studies. It's far too big to spend your time tracking down everything and each day if you want to write a book about Celtic paganism. The thing was, the only scholar who had looked into Canonus in any great depth in recent years, Phyllis Prey Bulber, didn't think he was a god of animals and of the forest, but of the underworld. Most frustrating of all was that her article, a link to which is in the description, was often referenced by scholars who did not, however, mention her conclusion. It was clearly time to look at the subject again. The first thing to ask was whether there was, in fact, enough evidence to say that Canonus was a god of the animals in the forest. When I looked closely, I was surprised to find there wasn't. Let's look at the evidence, then. The first piece, of course, is that he has antlers. This would have to be dealt with. What did it mean that he was part animal? Only one other Celtic deity, an unnamed god from northern Britain with horns, not antlers, was like that. Even in the Indo-European world as a whole, I was only aware of the Greek Pan, Iris, and Nike, and a lost, coarse-headed Demeter from Phagalia. Pan was originally primarily the god only of herds, not animals in general and the goddesses certainly weren't goddesses of animals of the forest. In other words, being partly animal did not make any of them a deity of the forest or of animals in general. What about all those images of him surrounded by animals, though? The truth is, there's only one, from the Gundestrup cauldron. This is striking and beautiful, but on a close analysis, turns out to be not his build. The first thing to notice is that Canonus is not, in fact, surrounded by animals. There are two to his right and six to his left plus a small figure riding one of them and a ram-headed serpent in Canonus's left hand. Of these, only three, a bull, a stag, and a dog, seem to be paying him any attention. We can even eliminate the bull. Often the image is shown cropped like this. This makes it look as if the bull is paying complete attention to Canonus. If we view the panel as a whole, however, we see that the bull is matched by one in the upper right corner, who is facing the same way, which means he has turned away from Canonus. So it turns out the bull isn't facing Canonus at all, just in the same direction as his partner. The two are artistic elements, filling in the top corners of the panel. Rather than showing any obeisance to Kernunus, the other animals are studiously ignoring him. Other than the stag and the dog, the only one facing him is a lion, who is more interested in fighting another lion than in Kernunus. A third lion, as well as the dolphin and the boy, are facing away from him. Finally, the fact that there is a little boy riding a dolphin prompts the question, if the animals show that Kernunus is god of the animals, is it also accurate to say that he is a god of little boys who ride dolphins? The final nail in the coffin comes from the fact that two of the other surviving inside panels from the cauldron also show a divine figure accompanied by animals, which would lead us to ask how many gods and goddesses of animals these Celts had. It is clear, then, that when we look at the Gundestrup cauldron carefully, it gives no support to the view that Cunnus was a god of animals. The only animals that do seem interested in him on the cauldron are the stag and the dog, something which will turn out to be significant, but not in the way they are normally believed to be. There are two other images which might be interpreted as showing Kernunus to be a god of the animals. One comes from Reims. Here he is accompanied by a rat, a stag, and a bull. Since they are burrowing animals, the rat here has been used as support for the view that Kernunus was connected with the underworld, and that may well be true. The stag and the bull can be interpreted as representing all animals, but they can be seen as representing them in a very specific way. I'll explain this later, for now I'm just setting the stage. The stag and the bull also appear on the fragmentary sculpture from Priod, and they will receive the same interpretation as those from Reims. Once we've put aside the god of animals explanation, we can also say that since he does seem to be connected with the domesticated bull and the domesticated dog, he can hardly be said to be a god of the forest or the wild. But what kind of god is he? To answer that, we will have to analyze the representations we have. Let's look at them and first see whether we have enough images with enough similarities that we can say that we even have a single god to deal with.
the earliest Canoas images are certainly those from Val Camonica, the Camonica Valley in northern Italy. These are rock carvings, some of thousands of those which cover large rocks in the valley. Of these, I'm aware of four which seem to represent Canoas. These are the three less famous ones. They are less clear than the fourth and convey less information, but they do confirm that we are dealing with more than a once-off image. The most famous is this one, from Capo di Ponte. It shows a standing figure with antlers and his arms in what is called the Orans position. There appears to be a torque, which was a neck ring worn by the Celts, around his right arm. He may be clasping an unidentifiable object in his right hand. The wavy line to his left has usually been interpreted as a snake, based on later images, and I see no reason to disagree with this view. I think that those who have gone further and see it as a ram-headed snake, however, are just seeing what they want to see. Canonis is wearing a long robe, just as he is in one of the other Valcomonic images. A smaller image stands in front of him, who has reasonably been interpreted as a worshipper. I have been unable to find photos or drawings which show these images in context among the other drawings in the rock, however, so it remains possible that he belongs to another grouping, or even on his own. The fact that he has a phallus need not tell us anything about Kyrnos, as there are many phallus-bearing images in Val Camonica, in non-erotic contexts, which suggest the possibility that the artist simply wanted to identify this figure as male. It is currently impossible to obtain clear absolute dates for rock carvings. Relative chronologies can be constructed, however, and those in one area correlated with those in, in others on stylistic grounds. By comparing those which can be dated with the others, approximate dates can be obtained. The consensus is that the Cernunnos carvings date from the 4th century BCE. With the Gunderstrup Calden, we've made a huge leap forward in artistic competence. This masterpiece is made of gilt silver, with a bowl-shaped bottom piece and plates that are connected above to form the Calden's walls. There are originally eight, approximately square pan outer panels one of which is now missing, and five rectangular inner panels. The outer panels each show a central figure accompanied by smaller ones. The larger figures are most likely deities, and the smaller ones either lesser deities or human attendants. One of the inside panels is this enigmatic scene. Other than that, it must represent an incident from ritual and or myth. There is no consensus about what is going on. Is it a human sacrifice, a rite of passage? Do we see a cauldron of rebirth, a ritual shaft? Is a large figure a deity, a priest or priestess? Why are the warriors on foot on the bottom and on horseback on top? Is the tree an artistic divider or is it symbolic? And most important for us, what's the ram-headed serp serpent doing here? Another panel is less confusing. It shows a deity holding a wheel, which is also held by a smaller figure. There are animals, two elephants, and three griffins scattered around the space, probably as space fillers. The main figure is usually, and I believe correctly, identified as a storm god. I'll discuss the reasons for this identification later. A third panel shows a female figure, certainly a goddess, also surrounded by animals. Unfortunately, we don't know what sort of goddess she was. And there's the Canunas panel, which we've seen already. The sudden increase in artistic sophistication as compared to the Valcomonica images is due to the cauldron having been made by a Thracian silversmith, although not far from the valley. Some of the elements that have identified the Thracian origin are the ivy leaves in the background of some of the images and the presence of elephants and griffins. Despite it having been made by a Thracian, we can be sure that the cauldron's imagery is Celtic. For instance, on the Duncan panel, three of the warriors are blowing carnixes, which were a kind of Celtic horn. A Celtic detail which, as far as I know, hasn't been pointed out before is the half-body representation seen in the storm god figure, the goddesses with goddess with the wheel and the deities on the outer panels. This form of image is also found in carvings in Val Camonica, where it seems to signify a spiritual being. How the cauldron got to Gundestrup in Denmark is not certain, although it was probably his war booty. Since it was discovered in a peat bog, it was initially believed to have been an offering. Pollen analysis has shown, however, that at the time it was deposited, the area was dry, so it's more likely the cauldron was hidden in a time of crisis. Its location could then have been lost by the death of the hider and whatever was causing the crisis. The dating of the cauldron has varied, but the current consensus is that it comes from the 2nd or 1st century BCE. I'd like to take a leap now in time and space to Lyon in southern Gaul in the reign of Augustus. This small silver cup shows what can only be an image of Canunas, despite the missing head, which I've been told by Alexei Kondratiev was clipped off deliberately. This may have been due to someone who was offended by an antlered god, either in Christian era or antiquity. He's been partly Romanized, both by his draping and his half reclining on a chair, but the rest of the iconography is clearly canonis like He holds a torque in his right hand and a cornucopia, another Romanizing element, in his left. 
There is a stag on his right and a dog on his left. The cornucopia has displaced the expected snake so that it's wrapped around a tree. This is a classical motif, the standard way of depicting the serpent of the Hesperides. The similarity of the imagery on the Gunnistrup column is striking, to the point where it is likely that the creator of the cup had seen either the cauldron or an image or images derived from it. The cauldron was most likely placed where it was eventually found sometime in the first century or slightly later, making it possible that the maker of the cup would have known the cauldron. It's more likely that the knowledge came indirectly, however. On the other side of the cup is Mercury, who sits counting money. As we shall see, Mercury is the Roman god most often connected with Canonis. We also see Mercury on the Reims image, for instance, where he stands on Canonis' left with Apollo to the right. Canonis holds Mercury's purse in his lap. He doesn't hold a torque or snake here, but he wears a torque around his neck, as well as an armband, which may be a substitute for one. There is another fragmentary image from Reims, which also shows the head of Cernunnos with the heads of Apollo to his right and Mercury to his left. Apollo appears with Cernunnos at Von Bouv. The other side of the block is too damaged to identify, but by analogy with the Reims, it has been reasonably suggested that it shows Mercury. The Cernunnos himself is unusual in being represented as young. There is a young boy on either side, each of them standing on a snake and holding onto one of Cernunnos' antlers. Besides the presence of Apollo and perhaps Mercury, there is a similarity with the Reims image of what appears to be a bag in Cernunnos' lap. One of the most famous images of Cernunnos comes from Paris, where it was found under the choir of Notre Dame in 1716. It's one in a series of four blocks that were originally piled on top of each other to form a pillar. There are other deities on the various sides of these blocks, some Roman and some Celtic. One block is Cernunnos, Matulos, Castor, and presumably Pollux. Another shows Jupiter, Essos, a three-horned bull labeled Tarwos Trigarinos, and Vulcan. A third is Fortuna, Mars, perhaps Venus, Mercury, and Rosmerta, and two unidentified goddesses. The final block tells us that it was dedicated in the reign of Tiberius by a group of sailors, which is why the pillar is called the Pilier de Nalt, the Pillar of the Sailors. These would have been those who plied their trade on the Seine River and might be called bargemen. This dedication raises the question of why sailors would have erected a monument that honored, among others, a god of animals and of the forest. The easy answer, and I believe the correct one, is that they wouldn't. Also important is the inscription. Each of the gods is labeled, and on a Cernunnos block we can see the name Ernuno. The first and last letters have been lost, but it is reasonable to assume that the inscription originally read Cernunnos, and indeed that is how it is represented in 18th century engravings. The yes S ending is unremarkable, being simply the Gaulish nominative singular ending. The C can be restored by an assumed etymology based on Proto-Celtic carnos, meaning horn, antler. The no infix is common in Indo-European deity names, thus we have a name meaning antler god. The man on the block of course has antlers, around each of which is a torque. We can tell from the other figures on this block that the Cernunnos image must have been sitting cross-legged. There isn't room for him to have been standing or sitting on a chair if his body is to be proportional. Because this is the only case where we have both an image and a name, and because its etymology is so clear, it has often been said to be a title rather than a name. We first need to answer the question of what the difference between them is. The best I can tell, when people say this, they are saying that the god had a real name that wasn't Cernunnos, and that he was called Cernunnos occasionally, but this wasn't considered essential to his identity. This is wrong for several reasons. First, the transparent etymology of the names of other deities hasn't prevented scholars from saying that they are names rather than titles. For instance, Epona clearly means horse goddess, which is just as descriptive of her as Cernunnos is of our god. Second, this involves a misunderstanding of how titles function in the Indo-European world, where they serve to specify a particular form, origin, or function of a deity. It is difficult to place this in the context of Cernunnos. In what way would Cernunnos be a specifier limiting the deity in form, origin, or function? Perhaps this is an out-of-date argument, because there are in fact other inscriptions to Cernunnos, although they are not accompanied by images. There are two identical ones from Luxembourg in Roman letters, which read to the god Kerunenkos, one from southern France in Greek letters to Carnonos, and one from Polenza in Italy to Kernono, which would be the dative of Kernonos. Variations in spelling like this are common in Gaulish inscriptions, and could be due either to the lack of ability on the part of the inscriber, the difficulties adapting a language to a new alphabet, or in this case alphabets, or local variations in names. We find inscriptions to the thunder god Taranus in the form Tanaris, for instance. The final pre-Roman representation is on this coin from the Remi tribe. Here, Canunus has a torque in his right hand, and his legs are as crossed as space will permit. His antlers have been crowded so they arch downward. 
the curved line at the back of the coin may be a displaced snake. Now we will look at the images from the Roman period, and from them, as well as from the earlier ones, see what shared characteristics we can find. Then we will be prepared to discuss their meaning. This image was found in a well at Semerico. A man sits cross-legged on a cushion on a block. He's wearing a torque and originally had earrings. There are two holes in his head where antlers would have been inserted. A ram-headed snake is draped down each shoulder, resting its head in his lap. He holds something there, perhaps a plate, perhaps a bag. Also from Semerocor is this goddess. She is sitting with a bowl of fruit in her lap. She holds a cornucopia in her left hand and a pomegranate in her right. There is a ram-headed serpent wrapped around her with its head on the bowl. Because of the similarity in style, these two statues would have formed a set. Canonus is also accompanied by a goddess at Sant in Chahant Merati. He has a purse in his left hand and a torque in his right. The goddess holds a cornucopia and a dove. There is a unique feature of a girl or young woman next to the goddess holding a cornucopia and a piece of fruit. This grouping is the strongest evidence for Canonus' as god of the underworld, since groupings of Hades, Demeter, and Persephone were found in Greece, with Persephone shown as a maiden. On the back is another Canonus. He is accompanied by Hercules on his left and an unidentified goddess on his right. Both Canonus and Hercules are in platforms supported by the heads of cattle. This is most likely a reference to the myth of Hercules' tenth labor, where he brought back the cattle of Geryon. This theory is supported by the lack of cattle heads under the goddess's platform. Figures with antler holes have also been found at Candan and Atong sur This has given rise to two theories. First, that actual deer antlers were used. This may be the possible for the Candan and Semerikor images. The Semerikor statue is 1.2 meters high, large enough for them, and Vauber suggests that it was at least possible for actual antlers to have been used. The Candan image is only the top part of what was a larger piece. There were three heads, one on the central neck and the others resting on the shoulders. Any ram-headed serpent or carried torque would have been in the missing piece. The central head is wearing a torque, however. Because the bottom half is gone, we can't be sure that he had crossed legs, but the heaviness of the surviving piece suggests the necessity of a steady base. The two holes for the insertion of antlers are on the center head. I have been unable to discover their size, but based on the size of the image, which is 41 centimeters across at the base and 35 centimeters high, it seems possible to have used at least small antlers. This is not the case with the Atong Sur image, which is only 18.5 centimeters tall, far too small to have holes large enough for real antlers. This bronze canonist does, however, hold a torque in his lap and wear a bracelet on his right wrist, perhaps in a way similar to the Reims image's arm ring. He also has something else which is unidentifiable in his lap, perhaps a purse, perhaps some other container. Two ram-headed snakes wrap themselves around his waist and rest their heads in his lap. The other ends are fishtails. What is especially interesting is that there are two smaller faces on the top of the, his head, one looking each way. He is therefore, like the Condant image, three-headed, if less drastically so. The second theory is that the antlers were removable so that they could be added or removed to reflect the seasonal changes in the antlers of actual deer. However, there are traces of lead solder in the Atong Suoru and Semerikoi images' antler holes, which means that their antlers were firmly attached and unremovable. It is possible that the Kanda images' antlers were inserted and removed according to the season, but if so, this would be a unique feature, making it unlikely. But why have antlers that were made separately? I believe the answer can be found in the images from Amiens and Doré. The first is bronze, about 10 centimeters tall. He has the crossed legs of Canunas, and his left hand once grasped something which is reasonable to think was a snake. He doesn't have antlers, which has caused some to doubt that he represents Canunas. His right ear, however, is a deer's. The second image, somewhat larger at 40 centimeters, is made from six copper sheets soldered together. He sits with crossed legs, and the remains of solder on his thighs show that his hands once rested there. Whether they held anything is, of course, unknown. This image also lacks antlers, but his legs end in deer hooves. This has caused some to doubt whether this is a Canunus image. Bober suggests that he might be a priest, but this is unlikely. A priest wishing to connect himself with Canunus would be far more likely to wear a crown or hat with antlers than hooves. Instead, Amiens' ear and Bure's hooves would have been an easy alternative way to indicate a partial stag aspect. Based on these, I would like to suggest a more prosaic meaning for the separately created antlers at Condant, Etanse, Rue, and Somerico. 
It is very difficult to make antlers on a three-dimensional image. Casting tined antlers requires a separate pore hole for each tine, and stone antlers would be in constant risk of breaking, either in the carving or after. In those cases where three-dimensional stone images had carved antlers, in fact, they have come to us with the antlers broken off. Whether this happened in ancient times or at some point in their perilous journey to the present cannot be known, though. Bronze images, as we will see, have often solved the problem by simplifying the antlers. The problem was solved differently at Canton, Etons, Heureux, and Somericourt. Separately created antlers could simply be replaced if they were damaged. Rather than some mythical or ritual significance, then, we are seeing the result of the practical art of creating three-dimensional images. A different solution to the same problem may have been found at Vertil sur A cross-legged man wearing a torque holds a stag in his lap. His head is gone, so we can't know if he had antlers or not, but a stag may have been this artist's way of depicting the partial Servian nature of the god. There are other images that, like Etan sur Heureux and Kanda, have three heads or faces. This one from Bavay is on what's called a planetary vase. The name came from the theory that the faces on the vases represent the seven classical planets, possibly in the order they would be in as they are assigned to the days of the week. However, not all the vases have seven faces, and when the faces are identified as particular deities, they aren't always in the order of the days of the week. This is a shame. If they were, we would be able to tell something about Kirnunas by what deity his position would mandate. As it is, what we have is a three-headed bearded man with broken off antlers. The other three-headed image is from Louis Saint-Georges. An antlered god sits next to two other deities, one female and one either a young man or a hermaphrodite. There's a purse on the ground next to the antlered deity. At the base of the grouping is a tree and a number of animals. These may represent a fertility or prosperity function for the deities or may simply be an artistic choice. It may be relevant that among them are a stag and a bull. Most of the image we have seen so far have been sitting. There are standing images of Kernunus, however, including, of course, the earliest ones. He is also standing in this statue from Mont Saint-Jean. His antlers have broken away, but their stubs remain. He holds a bow in one hand and a bill in the other. This bronze from Majorid shows a standing man with a torque in his right hand. His antlers are rudimentary but identifiable. The stunting is probably another way of solving the problem of casting antlers. We have only a drawing of this image of unknown provenance. A standing man holds the neck of a ram-headed snake which wraps around him. This image from Mo may be an awkward representation of Kenonis. His legs aren't crossed, but he is sitting. The bumps on his head may be incipient antlers, and he holds the purse we've seen elsewhere. We may have here a representation from an untalented sculptor. There are also some images which seem to show a female Kenonis. A seated female image has antlers, the tines of which are somewhat rudimentary, probably for ease in casting. She sits with crossed legs. These are difficult to interpret. Are they canonis? It is significant, I think, that the two cases where both hands have survived, she has a patera, which is an offering dish, in her right hand, and a cornucopia in her left. This is like the Samericho and Sant goddesses. So perhaps here there is a combination of that goddess and canonis. There are a number of other images of cross-legged gods that can't be definitely identified as Canonis, but likely are. These include five images from Argentomagos, three of which are shown here. From the images we have already looked at, we can see a pattern of characteristics of a deity called Canonis. One, he has antlers or his part stag in some other way. Two, he not only wears a torque, but holds one, or he holds a purse. Three, he grasps one or two ram-headed snakes. 4. His legs are crossed. 5. He has three heads or faces. Not every Canonis representation will have all these characteristics, but they do form a pattern which is sufficiently defined that we can say we are talking about a particular god. I'd now like to turn to images which have sometimes been said to represent Canonis, but in my opinion do not. This one comes from Blanc in Bois l'Antique in France. It depicts a horned man standing on an animal that is difficult to identify. There aren't actually any of the elements that define Canonis here except for a purse in his right hand. There is no torque, he isn't cross-legged, and what he has on his head aren't antlers but horns. A decoration on the side has been thought by some to be a snake, but a close inspection shows it to be not a continuous serpentine line but a number of curved segments, perhaps meant to represent a twisted rope. There are a number of suggested representations from the British Isles. The most famous of these is probably the coin from Petersfield in Cambridgeshire, England. The first thing to notice is the band around the top of the head. We are dealing with headgear rather than something growing from a head. 
This does not rule out a connection with a Kununus cult. We could be seeing the image of a priest wearing some sort of crown. More damaging is that whatever are coming from the band don't, on close inspection, seem to be antlers. They don't have tines, only bumps. Still, this might be a result of an artist working in a confined space, as with the Remy coin. However, except for whatever is coming from the crown, there are none of the attributes of Kununus. No ram-headed serpent, no torque. We can hardly complain that there are no crossed legs, of course, since there aren't any legs at all. Still, although this lack isn't reassuring, it isn't disqualifying, since we've seen images with no identifying features other than the antlers. What settles the question is the wheel. There are no representations of Kernunus where he is accompanied by a wheel. It's always possible for a single representation to be idiosyncratic, but in this case we have a better explanation, one we've already seen in fact. This panel on the Gundestrup cauldron depicts the Indo-European myth in which the thunder god kills the serpent monster. In particular, this is the version where the thunder god is helped by a mortal. Notice that this mortal helper not only grasps the god's wheel, but is wearing a knobbed helmet. This combination of knobbed helmet and wheel is also found in the triumphal arch of Orange, where among the battle trophies shown is a horned helmet with a wheel between the horns. This probably represents an actual helmet. At the least, it represents a helmet type, one which is unlikely to have been invented by an artist. Now let's put the three together. It is clear that there is the intent of representing a human helper of the Thunder God, someone so powerful as to share in that God's greatest act. Whoever wore the helmet shown in the arch was trying to tap into that power, and whoever is depicted on the Petersfield coin was making that attempt as well. We can therefore say that rather than Kernunus, we are seeing a very human warrior. The god in this mosaic, in the Verulamian Museum, is sometimes put forward as Kernunus. A comparison with less ambiguous mosaics, however, makes it clear that we are seeing a sea god, and that what at first glance seem like antlers are crab claws. The final representation from the British Isles that has been connected with Kernunus by some is on the 9th century cross shaft from Clonmacnish in County Offaly, Ireland. Here we find a man with crossed legs and something growing from his head. The fact that we are so far away in time and space from the undoubted Canonis images should give us pause. What we have instead is a man whose legs and arms are interlaced in the style common to Irish art from the period, with what is growing from his head being nothing more exotic than hair. With these images eliminated, the only one from the British Isles that depicts Canonis is the one from Sicester. A man with antlers squats with legs that turn into ram-headed serpent whose necks he grasps. On either side of this head are open containers we see from the top, but what they contain is unknowable. Fruit, eggs, from analogy with other images I suggest coins. What are we to make of this image? This turns out not to be a problem. The area around Sicester is, was inhabited by immigrant Belgae, members of a tribe from the continent in whose territory other images of Canonus were found. This is not a British Canonus then, but a Gaulish one that happens to be found in Britain. An image from outside Gaul in the British Isles, some have said is Cernunus, is this one from Numantina, modern Numantia in Spain, on a pottery shard. What appears to be an antlered man holds his hands in the Oran's position. He isn't holding anything, and his legs are broken away. It's most likely, however, that this represents an animal seen from above. There are other images from this culture that certainly show just that. It's difficult to see, but there are what appear to be the ends of claws in the lower left of the image, just where they would be at the end of missing feet. We can eliminate this image from consideration then. From the images I have shown, plus a few others, we can create a map of where Kernunus images have been found, which will give us an approximation of where his worship existed. The black dots represent fine spots, the black threes the tricephalic images, and the black letter eyes the fine spots of inscriptions. The fine spots probably don't tell us everywhere Kernunus was worshipped, of course. He might have been worshipped without images, or with wooden images that have rotted, or bronze images that have been melted down for the metal, or simply images which haven't been found yet. To a certain extent, our map might reflect the pattern of modern excavation rather than ancient worship. However, France and Western Germany have been poured over enough, and enough Kernunus images and inscriptions have been found, and equally important not found, that I think it is legitimate to draw conclusions from our map. The fact that the fine spots clump together in a fairly limited region supports the idea that this is one god rather than several depicted in a similar manner. Now that we know that he existed, what characteristics identify him, and have a rough idea of where he was worshipped, we can start trying to figure out what sort of god he was. We'll start with the Torque. Canonus is so strongly associated with those Celtic neck rings that he might almost be called the god of Torques as appropriately as the antlered god. Other deities may wear them and sometimes hold them. 
The Cernonis almost always wears one, and not only that, but holds one, or has one in his lap, or in the case of Notre Dame, has one hanging from each antler. What does a torque mean? It's sometimes said to be a sign of divinity, but there are two problems with this. First, there are images of Gaulish deities that aren't wearing torques. Secondly, there are images of non-deities wearing torques, such as the famous dying Gaul. The impression that they are signs of divinity may be skewed by the relative lack of Gaulish images that aren't of deities. So what do they mean? Most likely they are a sign of wealth and power, two things that were as inseparable in ancient Gaul as in the modern world. Many of them were made of gold or silver and would have been worth a good deal. Even those of iron or bronze would have been expensive. It is just this that I believe the torques of Canonis to have symbolized, not divinity or the less specific idea of power, but wealth, in particular wealth created by human effort, wealth derived from culture. That the meaning is wealth is emphasized by the torque having been replaced by purses in images such as those of Reims and Von Duve. Now let's turn to the ram-headed snake. This is a peculiar animal, but not one peculiar to Canonis, being found elsewhere. Note that in two of these examples, it is associated with a warrior god. Remember that we've also seen it twice in the Gunnarstrup cauldron, besides the one on the Canonis panel, in one case with a thunder god. It is, however, closely connected with Canonis, and is almost diagnostic of him. It has therefore attracted a lot of attention by those trying to figure out what sort of god Canonis was. This attention is focused mainly on why these two animals. Of all the animals that can be combined with a snake, why a ram? One suggestion has been that a sheep is particularly connected with sacrifice. Even if this is so, and I don't think it is, it has been simply stated as fact, with little evidence presented to support it. And if it were true, what would be the reason behind its use here? Others have suggested that it is specifically connected with the underworld, but the pig is far more often found in that sense. Determining the meaning of the ram-headed snake takes a surprisingly far field. It will show us that it is not too idiosyncratic to belong to more than one culture, as Miranda Green holds. It is, in fact, found as far away in space and time as China, in the Shang and Zhou dynasties, which extend from circa 1600 BCE to 256 BCE. Here we see it on a bronze ritual vessel, and here it is on two others. I don't think this is a coincidence, but we have to show how it got to Gaul. The answer is via the Silk Road. We know that the Gauls had access to silk at a very early period. The Hochdorf chieftain from 530 BCE was buried in a silk garment. It wasn't just silk that traveled on the road, however. Artistic motifs made their way too. Among these were snakes with animal heads. Here we see a Scythian bridle depicting a woman whose legs are snakes that terminate in lion's heads. We can get a lot closer to Kunis's ram-headed snake, though. This grieve is a startling find. Like the Kunis strip cauldron, it is Thracian and repoussé gilt silver. It has the same ivy leaves in the background. The similarities are astounding. It's as if the two were made by the same artist, or at least one in the same artistic tradition. Yet here we find the ram-headed serpent unconnected with Kunis. The face on the grief may or may not represent a deity, but the serpents seem to be there solely for artistic reasons. So to return to our questions, why does Canonis hold a snake, and why a ram-headed one? To answer both questions, we need to look at how snakes were viewed in ancient times. In many cultures, the fact that they lived underground connected them with the underworld. If we look specifically at the Indo-European belief system to which the Celts belonged, we see snakes considered to be ambiguous. They move without legs, thereby breaking the rules. They are covered with scales like fish, again breaking the rules by being in a way water animals that live on land. By being ambiguous, they were being anomalous. They did not fit into any category and therefore could be seen as opponents of order. Indo-Europeans were all about order, so snakes could be seen as bad, even evil. This evil of the snake is seen most clearly in the serpent killing myth. I've touched on this earlier with the storm god panel from the Gundestrup cauldron. A storm god kills a great serpent with his lightning and thunder throwing weapon, often with the help of a mortal. This snake is in the possession of treasures, which are usually expressed as the fertilizing waters, women, or cows. In Indo-European societies, wealth was measured in cattle. In fact, the English word pecuniary, meaning to have to do with money, comes eventually from Proto-Indo-European pep, cattle. Women, via exogamous marriages, were a way to bind society together. Water was necessary for the production of food. In later medieval times, the wealth-withholding serpent becomes the dragon who hoards gold rather than letting it circulate. The serpent is therefore preventing the growth of crop, society, and wealth. Thus he must be killed, and this is done by the rain-giving storm god. This makes a connection with a war god understandable. The serpent is a source of treasure which is won by defeating it. The serpent slaying myth depicted on this panel is one way of doing that. Canonis is showing us another way. Instead of killing the serpent, he has taken it under his control. He may grasp it in his hands as on the Gundestrup cauldron. He may feed it, becoming its domesticator. 
One may rise up on either side as if to do him homage. However it is done, he is the master of the snake, but not by killing it. Rather, he brings it under his control and thereby becomes master of the wealth it provides. But why is it ram-headed? What is it about this snake that would cause a Thracian silversmith to use this motif from his repertoire? As I've said, snakes are ambiguous. For instance, the terrestrial Indo-European snake could also live in the water. This may be indicated by the fish tails and the Atong Aru's images snakes. Changing the snake's head to that of a ram is another way of representing this. Not only do we have the ambiguous snake, it has been made even more ambiguous by being combined with another animal, and not just any animal, but a ram, a member of a species that existed in both domesticated and wild forms, an ambiguous species. The ram-headed snake is therefore ambiguity squared, perhaps even cubed. Or maybe it's simpler. Maybe the Celt commissioning the Gunnarstrup cauldron just said, I want him holding a snake and make sure it's a scary one. And the Silk Road inspired silversmith said, no problem, I've got just the thing, and then dipped into his repertoire for a demonized serpent. By holding the ram-headed serpent, Canonus is therefore in control of the treasure-providing serpent who lives underground. How about the crossed legs? This pose is found almost exclusively with Canonus, but not completely so. There are crossed-legged images from southern Gaul that possibly represent ancestors. There is this image from Kili that does not depict Canonus. We have seen some images that are cross-legged, but that neither lack other elements that would identify them as Canonus, nor possess any that would disqualify them not because they never could have had them, but because if they did, the characteristics have been lost through damage. There is a good probability that these represent Canonus, but it is not a sure thing. This means that the cross-legged position could have been associated with a number of deities. It would be odd, though, if none of the images of those deities survived except for unidentifiable ones. I am therefore going to consider it as a characteristic of Canonus, even if not a necessary one, since there are standing versions. Perhaps the most common explanation for the cross legs is Diodorus Siculus's comment that the Celts sat on the ground. This explanation won't fly, however, since many of the Gaulish deities whose images survive are sitting in chairs, including ones which accompany Canunus. In fact, Canunus himself can be shown as sitting on a platform, and even in a chair. To get around this, it has been suggested that Canunus was quintessentially Celtic, identified with the dispater that Caesar tells us the Gauls believed themselves to be descended from and thus was shown in a typical Celtic sitting mode. This seems to me to be trying too hard, and would at least require evidence that Canonus was dispater, something that's weak, being limited to the Sant group and the Radit or Ims. Perhaps another suggestion has been made, he was a hunting deity, sitting the way hunters do in the forest. I've already made it clear, however, that it is inaccurate to think of him as a hunting god. The position has sometimes been treated as if it were a yogic position, or in some other way influenced by Eastern religious practice. It's sometimes called the Buddha position, the Buddha haltung, both influencing and being influenced by this idea. Identifying the position by a term identified with Eastern religion has led to some look for its origin there. There is, however, no evidence among the Celts of the sort of positions involved in either Buddhism or Hatha Yoga, making this connection unlikely. Others have noticed that on the Gundastrup cauldron, Canonis' legs are not in fact crossed. In fact, they aren't on any pre-Roman image. They have therefore interpreted him as dancing. We don't know much about the use of dance in Indo-European religion, and it would be taking an excessive leap to assume that that's what we have here. I suggest that the reason for the position is a far more prosaic one. To explain it, I will have to go back to Val Camonica. In the valley, there are rock drawings that show a combined stag and man. Note that in one of these, the human part is like the busts we have already seen from the valley and from the Gundestrup cauldron, and which seem to indicate divinity. The other image is more interesting. Here the stag has been transfixed by a human figure, which is shown completely, that is, in a fashion unusual for val deities. Even with the bust version, the stag is shown completely. The combined stag man is standing. This continues in the four val Camonica images. The god is shown standing and in full form. We can conclude from this that there was a tradition to represent Canonus with a complete body and standing, probably as a continuation of the full-formed and standing stag man. We now turn to the Gundestrup cauldron, Canonus's first post canonican appearance. Almost all the figures that can be considered divine there are in the bust form. The only possible exception is the person in the dunking scene, who may well be a priest. That person at Canonus, that is. Again, we see a standard of representing Canonus's entire body. This presented the artist with a problem. A completely bodied Canonus would have small proportions in the limited space, especially when his antlers were taken into account, and even more so when compared with the other divine figures. Since only half of them had to be represented, they could be considerably larger than the equivalent part of Canonus's body. The answer to this problem was easy. 
to bend Caronus's legs. This would have given the space for him to have a large body. Note that his legs are not actually crossed. In fact, they aren't particularly close to being crossed. I've already suggested that Canunus was introduced to the West via the Gunda Strip cauldron or its artistic tradition. I believe that the crossed legs of the Western images were based on a misinterpretation of the Gunda Strip cauldron's version. This turned a standing Canunus from Valcamonica into the Western cross-legged sitting god, giving the Gunda Strip cauldron the status of a transitional fossil. By now you might be beginning to despair that it's possible to say anything about what kind of god Canunus was. The animals on the Gundestrup cauldron, the crossed legs, and the fact that the snake has a ram's head have all turned out to be meaningless. Other than the distribution of his worship, what can we say about him? What is left to tell us anything? The obvious place to look is among the gods, both Roman and Celtic, who are represented along with him. Before turning to those, however, there is one last bit of noise that needs to be removed, an inappropriate comparison with another god, the one found on this Indus Valley seal. The first thing to consider is that is from years and thousands of miles away from the closest Canunus. It would take a lot of evidence to show a convincing connection. Not only is the evidence not there, there is contradictory evidence. To begin with, the figure is more likely to be female than male. What appears to be a phallus is actually a decoration on a belt, something associated with female figures in the Indus Valley. The rings on its arms are those found only on female figures. The fan-shaped headdress is also worn only by females. This isn't enough, there are images of the figure in profile in which it is shown to have breasts. In addition, the animals surrounding the figure are most likely artistic elements since there are other images that lack them. Finally, and I think this most convincing, the Indus Valley figure has buffalo horns, not antlers. It's a bit funny too that the two horns have been seen by some Celticists as connecting the figure with Kirnunus, while the three parts of the headdress have led some Indologists to connect it with Shiva. With the Indus Valley eliminated, we can return to Gaul and the gods that are found there with Canunus. This block from Bagran has Canunus on one face and three other gods on the others. Unfortunately, this is more frustrating than informative since there isn't enough on the other sides to tell us what kind of gods these three were. One famous Gaulish god found in connection with Canunus is Essus. We know a little about him. The cranes and bull relief is somehow connected with them, and we have a text that says that humans were sacrificed to him and that he was identified with either Mercury or Mars. Another text may connect him with healing, and there is an inscription where Esunertus, or Strength of Essos, is a title of Mercury. The Notre Dame image is more cryptic than informative. A man is trimming a willow tree. It is sometimes said that he is cutting it down, but he isn't holding an axe, but a bill, a tool which is used in pruning. Why he is pruning the tree, and more importantly, why sailors would erect an image of a god pruning a willow tree, is anyone's guess. Perhaps the pruning caused the growth of poles, which were then used to propel craft to the swampy sen. We simply don't know enough about Essus for him to be of any help in understanding Canunus. Smertulus is more promising. We don't know much about him either, but he is shown here attacking a serpent with a club. This is also the way Hercules was sometimes shown. Some connection between Smartulus and Hercules may therefore be met here. I'll discuss them when I talk about that god. With one exception, which will also be dealt with later, the only other Celtic deities Canunus is connected with are the unknown ones from Bauchan and the goddesses at Semerico and Sant. Like most of the similar goddesses from Gaul, we don't have a name for them. Based on the cornucopia, however, we can assume that they were connected with agricultural abundance. If we make the reasonable assumption that the intent is for them to complement Canunus, we can conclude that he stands for another kind of abundance. Mention should be made here of the deities from Louis Saint-Georges, but we can't even tell whether they are Celtic or Roman, let alone what deities they are. The Gaulish deities have disappointed us then. What about the Roman ones? The first of them we will look at is Mercury. It is often said, and rightly so, that of all other gods, Canunus is most connected with Mercury. We've seen him twice at Reims, and at Lyon, and possibly Vendouve. The mercury Canunus association goes beyond connection, though, into conflation. The two are mixed together in various ways. The purse he is often found with is an attribute of mercury, especially among the Celts. Mercury and Canunus can be mixed together even more closely. It starts with the wings on Mercury's hat looking like antlers, as in this statue from, from Clément Ferrand. There is another image from the same place that makes the identification differently. This god has Mercury's caduceus, but unlike the classical Mercury, he is bearded and sitting down. His legs are crossed a bit at the bottom, which is our first hint that he is partially canonous. The connection goes further when we note that a ram-headed serpent is resting its head in his lap. 
Ram-headed serpent also accompanies this god from Neri Le Bon, who wears Mercury's hat and holds Mercury's purse. There is this image from Puy de Touge, a, which has a god wearing Mercury's hat sitting cross-legged on a platform. Finally, on a relief from the Beauvais Museum, Mercury is accompanied by horned snakes. Canonis is therefore strongly associated with Mercury, to the point where the two are sometimes combined. And yet Mercury is not a god of animals, the forest, or the wild. It seems odd, in fact, that many writers who identify Canonis as that kind of god mention only a sentence or two later the strong connection with Mercury, who decidedly is not. For the Gauls, Mercury's primary concern is with financial prosperity and commerce, his purse being more common than the caduceus. A second Roman god found with Canonis is Hercules. A stone block from Metz has an image of Hercules on one side and Canonis on another. Hercules is also on the grouping from Sant, with his bulls there supporting both him and Canonis, and a Mirabeau accompanying this standing Canonis. Mirabeau Hercules' image has been identified as the god Circellus, but what he has over one of his shoulders is almost certainly the lion skin that Hercules always wears. There is also a lost block from Alb, which may have shown a standing Canonis, a Hercules, a victory, and an unidentified goddess with an open purse in one hand and coins in the other. As we have seen, Hercules may be present in Celtic guise at Notre Dame as Smertulus. Hercules had a number of functions. Here I'd like to point out that because of the journeys he had to make for his labors, he became a patron of travelers and, by extension, of merchants. Apollo appears twice at Rheims and Vendouvre. In either case is he the only other god present, however. In one case he is definitely accompanied by Mercury, and in the other this is likely. Finally, there are the gods from the Pillar of the Sailors. I've already mentioned the possible Hercules on the same block with Canonis. Also in that block are Castor and Pollux, gods of sailors. This block can therefore be interpreted as having two sailors' gods, one merchant or traveler's god, and Canonis. The evidence from the Roman deities, as well as the occupation of the erectors of the Notre Dame pillar, give us the message that Canonis was a god connected with commerce. This interpretation turns the usual one on its head. Instead of being a god of nature, he is god of culture. This does not completely negate Bober's identification of Canonis with Pluto. Pluto was god of the underworld, and therefore god not just of the dead, but of the metal riches to be found under the ground, those represented by Canonis's torque and coins. Having concluded that Canonis was a god of special interest to merchants, we still have to ask why. How did this deity with antlers become associated with commerce? To answer this, I will now look at not just the elements of his representations, but how they are depicted in relation to each other. I will show that they don't just have individual meanings, but are a part of a system. The torque and snake are found extremely often. There are two ways they can appear. First, the torque can be held in the center, as a tang sur heureux, or replaced by a purse, as a bandeau and some In these cases, there are two snakes, one on either side, with the exception of rings, which lacks the snakes, but presents its own system, as we will see. Second, one could be held in one hand and one in the other, with the torque again being possibly replaced by a purse, as in this image from the British Museum. In the exception of the Remy Potin coin, the lack of the snake can be explained by a lack of space, having been moved to the coin's reverse. Even here, though, the torque is in the right hand. Two things can be noticed here. First, whenever there is one, there is almost always the other. The two are paired. Second, when they are held in different hands, the snake is always in the left and the torque in the right, although an image of Mercury from the Compiègne Forest has them reversed. This is significant because of the distinction in Indo-European thought between right and left. Right is positive, light, above, order, and culture, while left is negative, dark, below, chaos, and nature. The torque and snake are arranged according to this plan. In Canus's right hand is a culturally created torque, symbol of social status, and his left is a snake which comes from the chaotic natural world below. We see a similar but different organization with the two animals on the cauldron. On Canunus's left is a dog. This is an animal of culture, so in that sense we might be surprised to see it there. However, it is also a predator and a carnivore, and therefore a dealer of death. On the other side is a stag, animal of nature, but also a food supply and an herbivore, and therefore an animal of life. We therefore see two sets of symbols, torque and snake, stag and dog, each of which represents an opposition in the horizontal direction. The system is much richer, however. The elements also complement each other vertically. At Canonis's right, we have on top an animal of nature, 
and on the bottom an article of culture. On his left, there is an animal of culture above one of nature. In the middle of this is Cernunnos, who in himself contains both nature in his antlers and culture in his human form. Putting this in the form of a chart, we see this. The Gundestrup cauldron is not just a mix of symbols then, but a map in which they have been located to convey maximal meaning. But is this a fluke? Have I just been reading my own ideas into this image? The theory needs to be tested. I have already mentioned something that can be seen as a test, that when Torque and Snake are in separate hands, it is always Torque right and Snake left, which is just as the theory would predict, and even in those cases where a different system is used, that system is a balanced one, not an opposite version, where we would have found the Torque in the left hand and the Snake in the right. Another stronger test is to look at other images where we have attributes beyond the minimum necessary to identify Canunas, but which are different from those in the cauldron. Let's start with Rheims. Here there is neither torque nor serpent, although the arm ring might be a stand-in for the torque. If so, notice that it is on the right arm. What we have instead are two Roman gods and two animals. What are the characteristics of these and in what way do they support or detract from my theory? Apollo and Mercury are a natural pairing in Greco-Roman mythology. Since the Roman mythology about Mercury comes from the Greek Hermes and Apollo was taken over wholesale from the Greeks, we need to see how they were related in Greece. The relationship is established in the Homeric hymn to Hermes. Hermes, while still an infant, steals Apollo's cattle and then lies about it. The two are eventually reconciled by Zeus and become friends. Because of this episode, Hermes became god of liars. Apollo, on the other hand, is god of truth. He is also god of light into the world above, whereas Hermes is the god who conducts souls to the dark world below. The two, therefore, represent paired opposites. The two animals are also connected, not just by being animals, but by their being male and two largest providers of meat. They differ, however, in the deer being wild and the bull being tame. They therefore both provide a kind of prosperity, but in opposing ways. In both gods and animals, we therefore find opposing pairs. There is also an opposition within the vertical pairs. Apollo is the preeminent deity of culture, and we find him paired with the archetypal animal of wilderness. Mercury, on the other hand, the liar, thief, and conductor to death, stands in opposition to the culture of which the bull is the symbol. The relationship is shown here. Between pairs of opposites of human shape and animal, wild and tame, sits Cernunnos, both human and part animal. A second test of the theory is even more idiosyncratic, the image from Mont Saint-Jean. This god is clearly identified as Cernunnos by the stumps of broken-off antlers, and yet he is standing rather than cross-legged, isn't accompanied by a ram-headed snake, and though he is wearing a torque, he isn't holding one. What he does hold, however, are a bow and a billhook. Those who wish to see Canonis as a god of the wild might be heartened by the bow. This interpretation is denied us, however, by the presence of the billhook, a tool not associated with hunting the wild or animals. So what do we have here? Pruning, although it cuts branches off and is therefore seemingly destructive, is performed to encourage growth. It is a constructive act. It is, of course, performed on trees, not wild trees, however, which would support the Lord of the Forest theory, but domesticated ones. The bow, on the other hand, is used against wild animals. It is a destructive tool, one which kills, but also one with, through which food is provided to mankind. So here again we have a series of opposites expressed in objects. In one hand is the vegetal, domestic, growth-promoting bill, and the other the animal, wild, destructive bow. We therefore have the same message as that conveyed by the usual torque and serpent combination. The artist has chosen to represent this message in his own way. The objects are different, but they are still opposing. The artist possessed the genius to represent several versions of oppositions in a minimal number of symbols. We can see then that the message can be conveyed in a number of ways, but it's still the same message, that of Canonis as a god of bidirectionality, himself both god and man, his nature is expressed and manifested in other paired opposites as well. This theory can be further tested by comparing Canonis with another Celtic god with whom he has sometimes been conflated, one whose Celtic name is unknown but has been given the modern name of the Tricephalus, the three-headed. This deity's iconography is consistent and his worship is centered on the region of the Remi, which we have already seen to be in the area where Canonis was worshipped. The imagery is of a triple face on a shaft. There is one face that looks toward us, with one on each side of it, one looking left and one looking right. The faces we see in profile each share an eye with the central face. A fair number of these have been discovered, 
primarily in Reims, although this one is from Paris. Canonus can be tricephalic. He is shown like that at Bavay, Louis Saint Georges, Conda, and at Tang sur Aru. Even when he is tricephalic, however, he is recognizably canonus. In only one of the four tricephalic canonuses does he have the frontal face sharing eyes form, and we never find an image where a tricephalus on a pillar has antlers. The tricephalus can be seen to overlap canonus then, but not be identical with him in general. In particular ones, however, the two have been combined. This indicates that they shared characteristics, most likely functions, that cause their worshippers to identify them as the same god. Before following up on this, we have to consider the possibility that Tricephalus is in origin the same god as Canonus, who has been represented without antlers because he is meant to indicate Canonus at the time of year when stags had shed their antlers. The probability that this is correct is increased by two of the tricephalic Canonuses, those from Condant and Tons de Aru, having separate antlers. I've already explained this in terms of practicality and pointed out that in the case of a Tons de Aru, the antlers weren't removable. There are three facts that indicate we are dealing with two gods that were at least originally separate. First, there is the standardization of the iconography of the tricephalus. This is a deity that has a clear identity. Second, the tricephalic canonus images don't have any part of this iconography except for the three heads. What we have here is one god, Canonus, who is seen as having something in connection with another, the tricephalus, without necessarily being the same god. Or if they are, it is Canonus that is the primary god, and a worshipper or worshippers of his have attached the three-headed characteristic of the tricephalus to their own god. Third, the tricephalus was worshipped in a much smaller range than Canonus. On this map, the Canonus tricephaloi are marked with black threes, and the non-Canonus tricephaloi are marked with blue threes. My inventory of tricephaloi is not complete, but what I do have shows a clear restriction of the plain tricephaloi. We must also keep in mind that based on the large number of images found there, Reims was the clear center of the tricephalus worship. I have accordingly used a larger font for its three. The indication is of a local deity absorbed into a more widely spread one. We still have to ask ourselves why the two deities would have been compatible enough for this absorption to have been reasonable. This raises the question of what the function of the tricephalus was. Beyond the three-headed or faced characteristic, and the limited extent of his worship, we have one more piece of evidence, which at this point should come as no surprise. He is sometimes associated with Mercury. Here we see the two deities together, along with the typically unidentifiable Celtic goddess. One tricephalus of Reims is accompanied by a goat and a turtle, animals associated with Mercury. And here we see all our deities brought together, a tricephalus accompanied by Mercury's rooster and Canunus's ram-headed snake. There are also versions where the pillar is topped with a ram's head and a bird, which is most likely a rooster. Here we probably have the tricephalus acquiring the characteristics of these deities rather than the other way round, as we saw earlier. The association with Mercury indicates that, like Canunus, we are dealing with a merchant's god. But why three-faced? And why, beyond the merchant function, was he connected with Canunus? I think the connection comes to what we've seen as the defining characteristic of Canunus, his in-betweenness. He can be seen as looking both ways. And that is exactly what we have with the tricephalus. In the standard way of representing the tricephalus, we don't have three heads. There is a full face looking forward and two half faces looking to the sides. I suggest that this expresses his nature. He is a god who is single, but looks either and both ways. He, like Canunus, is a god of bidirectionality. That the Gauls saw this as a reason for the connection is shown by the image from the Tang Su Aru, which shows one large primary head with two smaller ones looking to the sides. The large head is who he is, and the two smaller ones are attributes. The same may be indicated at Kanda by only the central head having a neck. The other two heads are subordinate to it. My interpretation of Kinonus as a god of bidirectionality is supported then by his connection with the tricephalus. Now let's look at the Kinonus map again, this time with the non canonus tricephaloi added. I've marked them with blue number threes. The tricephalus images show up right in the middle of Canunus's range. If Canunus originated in northeastern Italy, how did he get to western Gaul? I am making the bold assertion that it was via the Gundestrup cauldron, either directly or through intermediaries themselves based on the cauldron. We have already seen how the cauldron's iconographical system survived at least until the Augustan age, when it shows up on the cup from Lyon. It is therefore reasonable that other representations were influenced, again either directly or indirectly, by the Gundestrup artistic and theological traditions, 
or by native western images that themselves had their origin in the Gundestrup schema. The deity as found in the cauldron would have been seen by merchants from the Paris Reims area, who then brought his worship back to their home area, where he was partially conflated with the tricephalic god. His worship would have appeared in a lesser degree in other parts of Gaul, also spread there by merchants. It is possible, perhaps even likely, that Canutus had his origin in a deity specifically connected with hunting, in particular of deer, or perhaps as a manifestation of a deer spear, a northern Italian deer kachina, if you will. However, as early as the Gundestrup cauldron, and obviously earlier enough for an elaborate artistic and theological system to develop, he had become much more than that. He had developed into a god of bidirectionality, ready to be discovered by merchants, and to be brought by them to western Gaul, there to be spread by them, and identified with the Roman Mercury and Hercules, and with the Gaulish Tricephalus. By looking at Cernonis in a different way, willing to discard our preconceptions, we have uncovered his identity as a god who himself looks in a different way, in both ways, in fact. Canonis becomes part of a sophisticated system of art and belief. He is rescued from the misinterpretation which had been applied to him based almost solely on his antlers and shown to be so much more. It is not only Canonis who has been rescued, however. The fact that we can see his representations is very carefully thought out shows the Gauls to have been far more sophisticated than they are sometimes given credit for. They are shown in this case to have been an urbane people to whom trade was a central concern, for whom a lord of animals squatting in the forest among wild beasts was not as necessary as a god who looks both ways. In fact, even if my theory of bidirectionality is rejected, it cannot be denied that he is connected with commerce. The supposed evidence for an identity as lord of the animals turns out to be non-existent. He is strongly associated and sometimes conflated with mercury, and the Notre Dame pillar was put up by sailors. These are things that cannot be denied, and they give us a wholly different view of Canonis than the traditional one. In the end, we find a god of the in-between who became a god of go-betweens.